hello everyone. My name is Elsie Kenyon, and I'm excited to be here today with my colleagues from Two Sigma. Now, Two Sigma is an investment manager which applies data science and technology to find value in the world's financial markets. So why, you may ask, are we here today to talk about games? Well, in Two Sigma's 17-year cultural history, there have been many successful internal challenges organized around games. You may have seen a YouTube video of our air hockey robot competition. We found that these games, and particularly games that pair humans with machines, are really unique opportunities for applying new skills um, to difficult challenges. Two years ago, two Sigma interns, Ben and Michael, here today, created an entirely new such game, Haylight, in which players play, bo uh, build bots that play the games for them. The Haylight artificial intelligence competition was so successful within Two Sigma that we opened up the competition globally, open, open sourced the code base, and repeated the process the next year with a brand new game. This fall, we'll launch the third annual Haylight artificial intelligence competition. Now, to date, there have been thousands of players from over 100 countries that have played Haylight. These player submitted bots have been written in over 20 different languages and have played millions of games. Now, on the one hand, a global programming competition has provided Two Sigma with a new source for identifying strong talent. But there's another stronger promise of Halight. At the top of this Halight 2 leaderboard, you'll see professionals, university students, and even a high school student at number four. We've seen players of all ages and experience levels engage with advanced algorithms, AI, and machine learning via this immersive game on their own and with each other. This is Halite 1. The rules of the game can be explained in a paragraph, but the branching factor, uh, but the game has a branching factor many times that of the game of Go. It's an open-ended environment in which many strategies can be successful. This laboratory-like nature is a feature of Halite, which you'll understand better, as, which you'll understand further as Ben and Michael contextualize Halite in the history of games and share the principles guiding Halite's development. Running Halite requires significant back-end resources. Jack will explain how Google Cloud enabled Two Sigma to run a global AI competition at scale with no downtime. We consider Halite a game designed for this era in AI and this era in technology, and we hope by the end of today that you will too. Now I'll hand it over to Michael and Ben. Thank you. Right, thanks, Elsie. Um, so, uh, back to one, okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Halite games, the predecessors, the process, the principles, and all that. We want to start with an introduction of sort of the evolution of games and how Halite fits into that, uh, that history. And as you know, all presentations need a cute picture of cats to succeed, here's ours. Uh, but it also has uh, an actual meaning for the, the presentation, too, that I think we often conceptualize of... Um, of games as a sort of uniquely human thing, but they're not. That we see games with animals all the time. Here, these cubs are sort of play wrestling so that when they have to wrestle for real later in life, they'll, they'll be ready. Um, and we think that this leads to an important uh, use of games, that really games under one uh, viewpoint, under one lens, are about learning. That a game is an environment with you know, very low risk in which you can try new strategies and ideas, explore, hone your skills, so that when it actually matters, uh, you'll be ready. Um, and uh, uh, continuing on in that thread, just a little bit about some early strategy games that stick around today. There are earlier games like uh, you know, Egyptian games of sort of dice that precede these games. But the ones that have really remained popular are these game strategies, primarily Go and Chess, 
uh, which originate uh, about 2,500 years ago and then chess about 1,000 years later. Um, and what's key about these games is that they're both, uh, you know, in their time, they've both been considered these tools for learning strategy that, you know, as a military commander, you'd be expected to be good at chess in addition to a good military commander. There was thought that there's some transfer of the skill between them. But that also, we see games kind of come into their own as a form of art. Um, and, you know, I think in, we might have this idea that games as art is very modern in that, you know, now we have all sorts of video games that are artistic and, you know, take you through some story and all that. But really, this originates a lot earlier uh, with these games. All right. So the history of games in machines is definitely a lot shorter than that of the history of humans playing games. Um, you know, it's about 50 years versus many thousands of years. Um, but it is a dense history nonetheless, and it mostly consists of machines beating humans at their own games. The famous example is Deep Blue uh, becoming superhuman on chess, and recently AlphaGo beating Lee Si Dull. Um, and soon, probably Dota 2 and StarCraft will be beat by OpenAI and DeepMind, respectively. But what we're really interested in with Halite in building this competition is making games that leverage both the best parts of humans and the best parts of machines. We want to design games where humans need to think through the strategies, think through the rules, think through the game logic, and then design systems um, that are executed by their bots um, nicely. Yeah. That, you know, I, I think that there's often a conception of the progress of AI as sort of antagonistic to humans, that it's like, well, all right, that's another thing that machines are better at than humans when Skynet coming. Um, but the, we don't see it, it that way. That there's, there's no reason that it has to be adversarial like that. That there, one could easily imagine a future in which um, you know, humans and machines coexist on the same games and learn from them together in different ways. And we're excited by that prospect. Um, so we're going to talk first very briefly about some of the predecessors of Halite, get into the Halite games, and then talk about the, um, the principles behind them. So uh, diving in, we start with the multi-agent programming contest, which is a yearly competition that's run since about 2005. And the, the key contribution that this really adds, we think, to the table is this, the multi-agent aspect. Uh, that when you're controlling a bunch of different agents at once, the kind of techniques that one has to use are very different than those when it's a single agent. That, you know, with a single agent, a very restricted number of actions, it's usually pretty easy to do pretty well with something like Monte Carlo or Minimax methods and just some sort of valuation function learned or hard-coded. Um, but once the, you explode the, the, uh, the state space with more, uh, more agents, the, the techniques that one has to use become very different, and the multi-agent programming contest really opened that up. Yeah. And additionally, these games are very hard for humans to play in a vanilla fashion. Like, unless they write either heuristics to guide them through the game, or they write boxes, bots as their executors, they are essentially unable to evaluate who's winning the game and decide what they should do. Yeah, and actually, what, one last point about the multi-agent nature, the fact that it is hard for humans to play is also a great motivator on the educational aspect of these games. But if you're trying to encourage someone young to get really interested in programming and they're like, what's the point of this? Like, why do I care? Having them see this kind of a game that they, you know, can't actually play effectively but looks interesting and that they might want to play, and then showing them that there's a path to this through computers is a really effective teaching tool. Uh, so that's another thing that comes out of this. Yes. The second predecessor to Halite is the Arima Challenge. Uh, which is a derivative of chess that's made explicitly hard um, for game-playing AI. Um, it's really impressive since um, humans were actually the best players of this game up until 2015, even though the game is pretty simple. The state space is pretty small. You're only making one move per turn. Uh, but still, evaluating the board is extremely hard for computers. And so we like to think that we drew on both the tractability and also the difficulty of Arima in making Halite. The, probably the most uh, direct spiritual predecessor of Halite is the uh, U Waterloo and Google AI challenge. Uh, this is the ANTS competition, which was the third and final year of it. And what this did um, was it took these you know, previous multi-agent uh, competitions and it just completely opened them up to the massive online scale that you know, now we have thousands of users. 
that whereas normally these you know, older uh, programming contests were like, you're on some mailing list, they send it out, you think it's kind of cool, you develop it for a month, and then you submit to some conference, and they rank them all, and that's you know, some side list on uh, something or another. Now we can engage with thousands of players, um, and the, an important contribution is also the real-time leaderboard from the AI challenge. And this is what enables um, the, it to be an educational tool that extends broadly beyond just a couple of individual academics. So, uh, yeah. so that brings us to uh, finally Vendinium, which is the last of our predecessors that we'll mention. It also sort of ran concurrently with Halite 1, so there's, there's elements of that too. Um, and one of the really nice things about Vendinium, you know, even though it's a, a single agent game uh, and differs from Halo in a bunch of ways, there's a lot of core sort of infrastructural differences, the, it's really nice visuals that like, you sort of see it and you're like intrigued and you want to know what's going on. Um, that the sprites moving around, it's very appealing. So yeah, and we like to think that in making Halo, we took something from all four of these games. Um, from the multi-agent programming competition, we took the genre of multi-agent games. From Arima, we took the difficulty of the game. Uh, from the AI challenge, we took the continuous global leaderboard. And from Vendinium, we took you know, the visual appeal and theming. And this leads in nicely to our description of Halite 1 and Halite 2. Yeah, so we'll start off with Halite 1, which ran between 2016 and 2017. Um, it had about 1,600 users yeah, over the course users. of three months. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll talk about a bunch of these, and I'll just get them out. Uh, so we're going to start with the rules of it, just to give a general overview of them. What you have here are three different players on uh, this map, this 2D grid, and each one has the objective of taking over the entire map. Players are um, moving each individual piece up, down, left, or right. Each turn are telling it to remain still. Uh, when they remain still, the pieces grow. That You can see that as the size of the square increasing. And when they interact with opponents, they fight and shrink. Um, so uh, for starters, you'll just you'll you know, immediately notice this abstract design. It's very mathematical, geometric um, in theming. Um, and uh, in fact, the the only real connection it has to any theme whatsoever is the name Halite. That the name Halite came from it sort of looked like these cubic crystals growing was one of the analogies that we thought of. Um, but an important a couple of important aspects of this, that we have the really simple rules and commands that you just heard the, all, basically all of the rules. There's not that much of it. You can easily explain it in well under a paragraph. And also the commands, that because you don't have you know, multiple types of units or anything, it, you're just telling your pieces where to go. It's really easy to get started. A side effect of this is you have a very clean API for programming. You can have a Python bot up in literally 10 lines of Python, um, which is just it's nice. Um, we also have the discrete grid space. This makes it very easy for beginners because arrays are such a natural uh, programming tool to work with. Um, and finally, we have the emergent behaviors of it, that even though the rules are simple, there is a lot to do in this game. From working with the you know, combat optimization to deciding when you want to grow your pieces or move them, or doing traffic control of all of your pieces, or deciding you know, when you want to expand your territory versus uh, attack your opponents and conquer new territory, there's a whole bunch of separate problems in this that all come from these very simple rules, and that's what makes this game so, so unique and interesting. Yeah, and when we're designing these games, we like to say that we want the players to play each other and not to play the game. Um, and so when you make the rule set simple, when you're not you know, just making a bloated game with a bunch of roadblocks, a bunch of you know, constructed problems for players to get through, um, you leave open the possibility of responding to other players, of having these nice emergent behaviors. And so this brings us to Halite 2. This ran last year. It had over 6,000 users. Um, and the game broadly works like this. You were the admiral of a fleet of ships. Uh, every turn, you look at all of your ships, and you set the velocity of each of them. Um, in addition to, and so the ships exist within a continuous space of movement. In addition to moving, the ships can do two things. They can dock on planets, and planets produce more ships. Uh, proportional to the number of ships docked on the planet. And they can also fight other ships. So loosely, when two ships are within a certain radius, they will automatically attack each other. And so the game was in many ways a response to Halite 1. We wanted to try out some different sorts of game design mechanics. And one of these is that it exists within a continuous space of movement. And the advantage of this is that users have 
more solutions that they can try out. Um, combat code and navigation are actually going to be more complex because of this. Um, the drawback is that programmatically, in terms of the API, it's more difficult. It's worse for beginners. And so because of this, we actually are probably reverting to a grid in Halite 3, which will come out in the fall, we should mention. Uh, and you should go sign up at halite.io. Um, yes. And also, combat was much more difficult in Halite 2. Um, in Halite 1, it was very local. It was if you move a piece onto another, um, they fight. But in Halite 2, you had to do global optimization to do combat properly. Um, players actually called it flocking. It's when you have a group of ships stay together, and they single out lone opponent ships. They surround them, and they destroy the ship. Um, and then one pretty obvious change between Halite 1 and Halite 2 is that now we have a theme. We're actually tying this to space wars. And there are a couple of advantages of that. One, it's probably easier for you all, just looking at the two games, not knowing what they are, to understand what's happening in Halite 2 versus what's happening in Halite 1. You see ships, you see planets, you see space. Um, and because of that, we can actually get away with some more complex rules. Because when you think of actually how physical movement works, uh, when you're controlling a ship's velocity, it's mathematically pretty complicated. But humans understand how it works. So they come into it with that intuition. And we can get away with a, a more interesting game. And then finally, an important thing we did with Halite 2 is we took away AI programmers or deep learning programmers' only excuse for not writing good bots. Um, that is, we provided them GPUs. Um, so on our servers, uh, they have basically the compute they need to run whatever gigantic convolutional neural networks they want, or deep RL systems. And we saw players use that um, in very cool ways. And yeah, so this brings us to a section on how we're going to describe loosely how we design these games, go over some principles. Yeah, so we'll start with the principles. Um, so the first principle of these games is they have to be simple. There's 10,000 things to do on the internet. Why should you do Halite? Even if you should do Halite and the games were, the rules were complicated, it's really hard for us to convince you to do Halite if you have to spend you know, two hours learning the ins and outs of some really complicated set of rules. So uh, we took inspiration from the game of Go with respect to this that um, you know, it's such an incredibly simple set of rules to work with, yet it's been incredibly challenging and interesting for over you know, thousands of years. Um, we really wanted to emulate something like that. Uh, uh, another side effect of simplicity is that you get a game which is fast to compute, which is uh, usually advanta well, so it's advantageous for a bunch of reasons. First, we are running tens of millions of games on our server. Fast to compute lowers our cost, which is nice. It also makes it easier for bot developers, that when they're uh, you know, testing locally and working on their bot, uh, if they can run 100 games really quickly between their own bots, it makes it much easier for them to iterate, and we get better, uh, more interesting submissions by the end of the competition. Um, a second principle is that these games need to be very visual. We like these you know, sort of bright colors on kind of darkish backgrounds that pop out. You have the movement that kind of catches your eye and draws you in. And uh, this, again, connects back to both the aspect of how are we, go how are we going to draw you in, but also, how are we going to make you stay? That uh, when uh, people are developing their bots, they're usually watching hundreds of games over the course of it, maybe thousands as they're uh, you know, developing, seeing other people's strategies and so on. And if it's not fun to watch, you're not going to want to participate. So, um, last, it also helps with the educational aspect. It makes it much, you know, especially younger students seem to care a lot more about this aspect, that it's much more helpful in drawing them in. Um, the game needs to be difficult to solve. It should be evident that tic-tac-toe would not make a great AI competition game because it, it wouldn't last very long until someone figured out the, the dominant strategy. Um, and in this way, the, the, the games that we work with need to not just be difficult to solve, but they also need to be, I mean, they need to be you know, beyond impossible to solve so that there's always a lot of room at the top for something, someone to do. Um, you don't want a sort of asymptotic behavior of you're getting really close to optimal the uh, strategies. Um, one of the ways that we achieve this, in part at least, is by having the uh, just a, like a, an action space which is just enormous. That the number of uh, you know distinct move sets for a standard halite position, halite one, was on the order of ten to the one thousandth. Compare that with three hundred for go, not ten to the three hundred, just three hundred. Right? There's a lot. It, it, Monte Carlo is just intractable when you have this sheer number of moves. So, um, and the final sort of most amorphous, uh, I, I love this animation, the final most amorphous element of 
the, uh, the game that it, is that it needs to be multidimensional. There needs to be a lot of different things to do in the game so that even if, as a developer, you decide, you know, okay, I've done all that I can do with, say, the combat optimization element of the game. I don't know what to do next. If that's all there is to the game, you'll get frustrated and probably stop. But we want there, you know, to you just say, oh, but I have the next thing to, for planet selection is, you know, that's the next thing I need to work on, or ship navigation, or you know, who knows what. But as long as there's at least five or six things to work with, um, it makes it more interesting at the upper level that you've got differentiation between the top players. So some bots are good at diff different kinds of things, and also makes it better for the even the new developer that there's just something for them to always do. So how do we design these games? So, well, the first thing that we want to focus on is the fact that it's really largely iterative. We don't know how to make these games right the first time. Most games will satisfy one or two of our requirements, but very few of them, three or four, and almost no games satisfy everything that we want. Um, what you see on the left is the oldest image I have from my laptop of Halite 1 development. Uh, um, and then on the right, the actual finished Halite 1 game. And, uh, what I, I hope you see are both the similarities between them, the grid-like space and the uh, sort of blobish expansion with spaces between, but also the differences, that there's, you know, the size of the map is very different, the rules internally which you can't see are different. Um, and there's, you know, two or three separate games that get us from the one on the left to the right. Uh, um, yeah. The next thing we really try to take to heart in cutting down these games once we've decided on a base set of rules is we try, to the best of our ability, to reduce the number of unit types and constants in the game. So when you, just by definition, have a lot of unit types in your game, the length of your rules is going to be huge. You, don't, you know, players are going to have to memorize a tech tree or the abilities of the soldier class versus the worker class, et cetera. And that's fine. That appeals to a certain demographic. But for example, MIT Battle Code uh, has, for a decade plus, uh, released games that take advantage of this unit type um, classing um, to much success. And uh, their demographic really loves it. You know, they enjoy uh, scouring through long page specs, trying to find that one hole in the balancing so that they can, you know, write the dominant strategy. Um, but that's just not what we're trying to do with Halite. We want Halite to be broadly applicable to all programmers on the internet. Uh, we want them to be able to write a bot after two minutes of looking at our API and looking at our game rules. Um, and so we really try and reduce that. This also, I think, ties into the theme of having players play against each other rather than against the game. That we sort of feel that, you know, when it's about reading through the spec and trying to just understand what the game is and how to, you know, best use the, the flaws or, you know, balancing of the game, then we really feel like you're much more so playing against the game than you are against the other players, that the games are much more interesting when you're looking at how players interact with each other, which we'll see a little bit later on our game theory section. And we just, we, you know, the game is really just a medium for players to actually interact and learn from each other, right? Yeah. Um, that brings us to the uh, point of emergent behaviors. This really is just a, a, a natural thing that comes from the fact that we require the games to be simple, difficult to solve, and multidimensional. So, Difficult to solve and multidimensional basically means that you have to have lots of distinct complex behaviors that come out of it, but yet, because it's simple, we can't write lots of complex rules. So the only solution to this is that we have simple rules, and from those simple rules emerge these complex behaviors. Um, what we have here, that what you're seeing, is uh, a Conway's Game of Life, a certain starting state. Um, and Conway's, for those who don't know, Conway's Game of Life is a cellular automata, which basically means that the state of each cell depends only on the state of its neighbors. And there's, the rules can be described in like three bullet points. It's incredibly simple. But from these simple rules come all these complicated behaviors that you have, you know, on, the, on the left you see what are called uh, glider guns, which are producing this infinite stream of gliders. And then this whole contraption is a, something called a breeder, which produces an infinite stream of these glider guns. People have even constructed entire Turing machines in uh, Conway's Game of Life, which shows you just the level of complexity associated with it. Um, so we, we were really inspired by that. We wanted to replicate that kind of emergence with Halite 1. Um, but there's a, a second side of this coin, which is that when the behaviors that you're trying to design are emergent, by definition, you can't understand them just by breaking it down to the constituent pieces. So, so as far as we know, the only solution 
to this is playtesting, that we make the games and we see whether the kinds of things that we expect to be effective are and the things that shouldn't be aren't, um, and make that all work. If anyone knows a better way of doing this, please come see me after the, the talk finishes. I would, I would love to know. <laughs> so that will take us finally to targeted statistics. Um, this is, I think, just more of a, a sub point of this, that often with these games when we're trying, you know, we have most of the game figured out. We want to just tune certain parameters of it, make it as interesting as possible. We'll sometimes also collect statistics that can be used to better understand the game. So what you're seeing right here, we've uh, co-opted from the uh, you know, field of econ economics the Gini coefficient, which is a statistical measure of inequality. We've applied it to halite maps to try to figure out how production on halite maps is distributed. So uh, if this, we're, this allows us to produce this distribution that basically shows us that you know, most maps have roughly this level of distribution of production through them, but that there's also this kind of variance. And this is, to us, this is a, a good kind of distribution because it shows that for a beginner, you can mostly ignore the outside of that distribution. You can say most games I'm going to be playing roughly work with this kind of map, this rough level of uh, you know, distribution. But that also there's, you know, on the outside, there's lots of different variety of maps that happen less frequently, and that makes for some really interesting games every once in a while. Um, so that allows us to help verify that the games that we're making really are interesting. Yeah. So now we're going to... Okay. <laughs> two clickers. Um, so now we're going to talk, you know, in broad categories about the solutions that, uh, the interesting solutions that our contestants uh, made for Halite 1 and Halite 2. I think this is a good point to mention that Ben and I, we think that AI encompasses a lot more than deep learning. There are a lot more interesting techniques, such as heuristic-based models and using game theory, uh, to solve the sorts of problems that deep learning, is using, learning, deep learning is trying to solve. Right. And that, for, the, for the record, we love deep learning. We, you know, there's a lot of amazing research that's come out recently in it. We just think, you know, tool in the toolbox. A lot of our users are very inexperienced at programming. Um, a, you know, the vast majority of them have under three years of experience. So we have to make sure that we support all sorts of different users, not just yeah. those that are interested in deep learning. Yeah. And so the most prevalent uh, category of solutions to Halite 1 and Halite 2 is just simply the heuristic bot. And all that a heuristic bot is, is it's just hand-coded logic, hand-coded strategies uh, for playing the games of Halite 1 and Halite 2. And so one example of a heuristic is just go to the highest production zone, which is actually shown here. So the production that Ben referenced before when talking about the map Gini coefficient is shown by, I don't know how well you can see it here, but it's the back shading on this visualizer. So you see that the area that this yellow player is going to is a high production zone. And so at the start of the game of Halite, uh, it tunnels to that zone and then starts to expand. So it can get a jump on its production rate. And heuristic bots are interesting to us for two reasons. One. They're really democratic. They're really simple. You know, anybody with moderate programming skills can write these bots. It's just simple logic. And then the second point is it requires humans to actually think through the strategy. And it's really in line with our human plus machine uh, way of constructing games. Uh, when you use something like Monte Carlo trees that are generally, generally applicable to all games, you're not thinking through the specifics of that game. You're just you know, applying that hammer, that tool in the toolbox to the game. Um, and the same is true for deep learning. But with heuristics box, you, re you really are combining the power of humans and the power of machines. This also, I think, ties into the educational aspect of it, that by forcing you to think through the, uh, the game and you know, your logic and what the effects of your logic will be on how your bot plays the game, we think this is a really important step in teaching lots of younger programmers how uh, to get better. That you know, this ability to really visually see how your changes affect your bot and the behavior is an incredibly valuable tool in learning to do, do so even more effectively. Yeah. And then this is a more complicated uh, heuristic schema for Halite 2. So we aren't going to go into too much detail, but this was from a top 100 player in the competition. And broadly, what he did is every turn he computed a gradient, which is shown here in 3D uh, with the hills and the valleys. And what he did for each of his ships is he looked at the gradient, and he had the ship go in a direction that a ball bearing would go if it was just rolling down these hills, right? And the whole strategy of this uh, schema is encoded in uh, a few set of parameters. And these parameters are just how much, in terms of downhillness um or uphillness, uh, various game objects will affect the gradient. So for example, you want to stay away a little bit um, from your own ships, your friendly ships in Halite 2, because if you collide with your own ships, um, they're eliminated, right? And so they'll have a bit of an uphill effect 
um, on the gradient. Yeah. Um, we do have lots of players that do utilize machine learning and deep learning. Um, so what you see here is a diagram of a CNN that was used to play Halite 1 to great effect. This was from user jstaker7. Um, so you know, certain kinds of deep learning methods don't work particularly well with Halite, namely the sort of AlphaGo style Monte Carlo methods because the space is so large. But lots of them do. In this case, this was uh, simply trained on the moves of the top uh, couple of users and got e uh, handily into the top 20 of the competition out of thousands of players. So that's pretty good, we think. Um, we've also had players use reinforcement learning uh, and policy gradients on sort of parametrized non-deep models. Uh, that's also been used to pretty good effect, top 100. Um, yeah. And we are excited for what's going to continue to happen, especially with Halite 3. Don't want to say too much except that we think that there's a lot of promise. We've been exploring it personally uh, for what can be done with Halite 3 in the deep learning space. So yeah. And then finally, finally, one of the nice things about Halite is that since we try and build in this multidimensionality, there is both the element of local play you know, at the piece level, and also there is definitely an important level of meta game, of meta play. And so we saw this in Halite 1, actually. At the end of the competition, a very important emergent behavior in the metagame was something called the non-aggression pack. And it was basically just an implicit alliance between every player in a game. Um, if you enter the alliance, the, bot, the logic that you encode in your bot is that you won't attack any other player until they've attacked you. And so say if five out of the six players in a game put this logic in their bot, that last six player is going to be attacked by all five first. Um, and so because of this, all the players at the top of our leaderboard in the last few days of the game uh, encoded this logic in their bot. It really exploded that. Yeah, it was like very unexpected by us. Like yeah. the, it's just a huge shift in the rankings in the last couple of days, um, especially including the, our very top user who probably was significantly influenced by his incredibly effective handling of this whole meta game. Yes. Um, yeah. So then finally, we're going to talk about our competition principles. Yeah, this is actually, these are the principles we take to heart when we're building the competition around the Halite games. So stuff like our learning resources, our website, our forums, our tooling, et cetera. And so the most important of these principles is that they need to be very beginner friendly, but also powerful. So like Ben said earlier, you know, we're dealing with people on the internet. They have, you know, minute long attention spans. They need to be interested by Halite after you know, just reading the game rules for a paragraph um, and looking at our tooling. Right? And so one way in which we make it very frictionless to onboard people is we support 20 plus languages. Um, most of these are contributed by the community. Um, but that means that you know, if you're a beginner and you like Python, you can jump into the game. But also, if you're you know, a Rust enthusiast, you don't have to deal with you know, the annoyance of Java. Um, but we also we take this to heart with our other resources. For Halite 3, we're working on um, a web IDE for users who are not competent in the command line, and also some more interactive tutorial experiences. And then the second thing we take to heart is uh, the competition is really real time to its core. So we've already mentioned the continuous leaderboard. That is central to how Halite works, and we've heard from users that that is one of the best things about the competition. Uh, for example, that third user you see there, Shami, is a very enthusiastic Allstate actuary who submitted 600 bot updates to the competition. Um, and our median level of bot submission was very high. I think it was like something around 20-something for Halite 1 was the median level. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the leaderboard got a lot of use because you can make just a small change to your bot, submit it, and within a cu couple of minutes, you're seeing that new bot playing games against everybody else on the leaderboard. It's very immediate feedback. And then we also need to build an collaborative spaces for users online. Uh, because often, other bot developers can help users better than we can help them. Because they've actually had you know, the annoyances, the frustrations, the joys of working on Halite. And we're coming into it with like, a lot of existing knowledge about the competition, because we built it. Um, and so one way in which we do this is we have a discourse form with some nice theming shown here. Um, this saw a lot of use, you know, 100 reply long threads about everything from bot strategies to bug reports, to uh, you know, tools, new tools that the community has developed. Um, a, somebody developed, a third party user, uh, developed a very popular visualizer uh, for Halite 2. Uh, that's a lot of use on the forums. And the second thing we do is we also have a Discord chat that lots of players used. And then finally, 
uh, what we're dealing with on the back end of Halite, which yeah, we haven't really touched on a lot in this presentation, but we're about to, is uh, kind of a hard engineering problem. Because we are, for Halite 2, we had about 6.500 users. And we need to rank all of these users very quickly. And so we run tens of millions of games of Halite on our back end to rank all these users over the lifetime of the competition. And so this is hard for two reasons. One, we're running untrusted user code on our servers. Uh, so security is a big problem. And then also, this needs to be scalable. You know, we're going from running no games at the start of the competition to many millions of games in a week at the end of the competition. So we need our infrastructure to scale up seamlessly. And so Jack, our lead engineer, is here to talk about that. Hi. Sorry. Uh, so as, as Ben and Michael said, it is a very, very difficult problem to solve. And for a very, very difficult problem, we require good architecture. So that's how we use Google. So Google has, in this way, actually granted us the ability to solve all of these problems in a very simple way, almost plug and play. Uh, and so right now, I'm going to walk you through all the problems, all the uh, challenges that we had, and how we solved them, and how Google actually helped us solve them. Uh, first of all, games are ripe with cheating. The greater the competition, the greater the want for users to cheat. And we store quite a large number of personally identifiable information here, including user emails, among other things. And those two factors mean we need a lot of security to ensure malicious activities at a minimum. Uh, and of course, we also run a large, large amount of arbitrary code, as was mentioned. Uh, we have 6,000 users with a total of over 50,000 bots submitted in over 25 languages and, you know, lots of frameworks. And that's a lot of untrusted code. Uh, and as I said, a lot of uh, personal identifiable information and all of that adds to the problem. Secondly, uh, variable ranking algorithms uh, need to play a lot of games before fair convergence, and especially if there's a lot of users, uh, this increases exponentially, which requires much more compute in many more games and with the time. And the outcome of this is either general frustration for users or large cost to the administrators, and many times both. Uh, regionality is also a big problem. A competition encompassing over 100 countries worldwide creates some complexity. Uh, explicitly, how do we provide uh, equally fast responses to players all over the globe? Though we don't require some millisecond responses like a lot of uh, multiplayer games require, we still need to do things with some expediency, otherwise users will be upset. Um, Reliability is a very common problem, but it's a problem nonetheless. How do we make sure that disturbances are minimal? Users generally shy away from anything, especially games they can't access. And it doesn't matter how fun you make a game. If you can't play it, no one's going to play it. So for that, we need to minimize the downtime. Uh, AI is another, well, quote unquote, problem that we want to solve. We want to make this game amenable to AI. Uh, and for games to be viably solvable, we need to provide both data and tools related to the problem. And especially as the data increases, which in our case includes megabyte replays from over 25 million games, which you can see is a lot, the problem becomes increasingly more difficult. Um, so how do we solve them? We have two types of solutions that we have here, ones that we technically got for free by using Google and ones that we had to build in-house. So I'm going to separate them in all of the solutions. First off, in terms of security, uh, through GCP, we got good containerization, so we didn't have to worry about that. Uh, we managed to close all uh, internet routes going outside of all our uh, machines that were running untrusted code, so people couldn't do bad things, like, say, Bitcoin mining in our machines. Uh, we, we placed uh, a good number of firewalls to make sure people just weren't doing bad things and talking to machines they weren't supposed to be talking to. Uh, we created a large amount of database and GCS isolation so that only some machines could talk to them. Uh, and of course, we use the great VPC service controls that are used widely uh, that really allow us to just talk to the machines that we want to talk and not have, e have any indirectness towards that. And of course, in our in-house solutions, uh, we had a vast number of system level defenses, including C groups, IP tables, among other things, that allows us to really isolate everything. Uh, we had bot anonymization, so if you're playing, you didn't really know what the other bots were, so you couldn't exploit anything related to that. And we created score penalties like everything else. I mean, we, you can think of that as really an AI problem. As people uh, do malicious things, you penalize them and they stop doing malicious things. So it's a type of reinforcement learning that we gave our users. Uh, 
So for score convergence, uh, in GCP, we had auto scaling groups, which were great because suddenly, based on the number of users, just automatically became bigger or smaller. And of course, that lowered the cost. And what lowered the cost even more significantly are preemptibles. Preemptibles made it insanely cheap for us to run a lot of things and get very quick convergence. In house, uh, we had effective scoring algorithms. We used the best of the best to make sure it was fast, and we tuned it to the best of our abilities to make sure it was really fast. In terms of regionality, uh, this was all in Google, thankfully. Uh, a reliable uh, regionality toggle switch is one of their best features. It's, uh, so we really just use that. And pl plug and play caching and CDNs uh, for website and data respectively significantly simplify the problem. Uh, Google has its famous mini nines, which you can see based on even the room you have here, the five nines room, uh, which makes the service portion of this a non-problem. Uh, however, the use of preemptibles adds a further complexity. Uh, machines now can and will go down at any point, making your code redundant, more specifically duplicating executions and services, saving results, doing backups, uh, using health checks, automatic restarts, recreates, and leveraging fault tolerant algorithms is not a new solution, but it's the key to reliability. Uh, the solution, of course, translates beyond preemptibles and ensures that even on a rather faulty execution, Byzantine failures will be resilient. Um, ultimately, Google is very, very well geared to solving AI problems. As you may have heard in other sessions, that's what they're amazing at. Uh, by utilizing very powerful GPUs and storing everything in GCS, uh, we significantly improve the process for all the users. Uh, for everything else, we wrote a number of training tools in Python to simplify the process in both interacting with GCP and Halite directly, which ultimately gives us this picture, which, sorry, which gives us this picture, which is specifically what our end picture was. We had CDNs serving all of the important data inside of our VPC, which was well protected, as I mentioned. We had three types of machines, all done by managed instance groups that grew or decreased as we required. Uh, in, in this sense, we had the website, which literally just served the website. We had the coordinators, which were the key API and managed to send uh, uh, games for the workers to play. Uh, the workers could only talk to the coordinators. Meanwhile, the coordinators were the liaison, the mediator in between GCS and Cloud SQL, where we really stored all that we needed to store. And through that, we got our complete picture. And now, for why Halite, I bring it back to Elsie. All right, so why again do we care about Halite? Let's go back to what Ben was saying about games' role in, in playing and learning, right? We learn through play, but competitions uh, also provide an opportunity to learn from each other. They're not just about winning. They allow us to educate each other through play any age, any experience level. In Halite, we've heard examples of how players learned by example of other bots. There were trends in different strategies. Players also contributed tutorials and bot postmortems to share what they had learned, and also expressed their creativity by finding new opportunities for new ways to play with Halite. For example, writing their names with their bots. Technology really enables this connectivity and a successful, uh, a success, successful competition. But you know, we see connectivity all over the place, including in, say, MOOCs, uh, which have forums and tutorials along with guided lessons. We think MOOCs are not adaptive or computationally intensive, so they're not really taking advantage of what technology has to offer for learning today. Our goal with Halite is really to exploit, exploit that possibility. So games and global programming challenges running in the cloud are immersive. They're open-ended with potential for any number of creative strategies, as we've heard. And they're adaptive, so they're suited to beginners who may just be looking to gain confidence in their first programming language, but also provide the opportunity for more experienced players to gain mastery of a particular skill set. Really, this is about engaging with skills and, and tools um, on your own terms. 
So if we revisit this question of how humans and machines can work together, um, let's go back to Ben and Michael saying that you know, Halite is really about humans working with machines, not competing against the machine. We've seen at this conference the increasing number of ways in which humans and machines are being paired together or have to pair together um, to solve problems in the real world. And the real world, as we know, is highly uncertain uh, and requires flexible and adaptive solutions. So our question is, to what extent can games and collaborative programming challenges like Halite actually serve as a training ground for training, uh, intelli training and building intelligent machines. Um, so playing a game is not just about winning, it's also about, uh, it's also about thinking through which we learn. And with these games we see there's no one path to learn, there's no pa one path to learning. And at the same time, there may be, we may have goals and specific skills that we'd want to acquire, but those skills have many applications. So at Two Sigma, we, we take learning and education very seriously. Uh, we take problem solving very seriously. And what we ask you to think about is, um, you know, what are the ways to really uh, be engaged in your learning? We think Halite, the global AI competition, um, serves a, a unique educational function with a lot of opportunity. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. As Ben and Michael mentioned, we're launching Halite 3 this fall and you can sign up, but in advance of the competition, we'd also like to design it to make sure that you can achieve your goals. So thank you very much.